Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. Early NFL historians believed a 16-year-old quarterback named John Brolier from Indiana College in Pennsylvania was the first professional football player because he accepted $10 and some expenses to play a football game on September 3, 1895. Well, they were wrong. And this travesty wasn't discovered until about 80 years later. In this episode, I'm going to give you the name of the true first documented professional football player and how a book on the field at the Battle of Gettysburg can be linked to Kirk Cousins in the NFL. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. Now we've stepped off our time machine, and the date is December 20th, 1867. And we're in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where our hero was born. Our hero is none other than... William Walter Heffelfinger. He went by the nickname of Pudge as a boy, and his mother was Mary Ellen Totten, and his father was Christopher B. Heffelfinger, who owned a shoe manufacturing company in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where his family rose to prominence, which probably made his life a little bit easier growing up as a boy. But then again, he was a pretty big dude, so I don't think there were too many people that were messing with this guy. Moving forward, I'm probably, I'm going to call our hero Hef, because I like that name a little bit better than Pudge, because it didn't really reflect the true athleticism and the freak that this guy was. So moving forward, let's call him Hef. Now Hef went to Central High School in Minneapolis, where, like I said, he was obviously bigger than the rest of everybody, so naturally he played sports. He played football and baseball. As we found out in the first episode, the first game was played back in 1869 that was kind of Americanized. It was a cross between soccer and rugby. There still wasn't a whole lot going on as far as plays and designs and things like that as there is today in NFL. So it was pretty much just athleticism. There was strength, speed, take ball, run ball, run through dudes, block dudes, tackle dudes. Um, I guess that was right up Hef's alley. He was just this big, monstrous, athletic dude who just seemed to be just as fast as everybody, if not faster. I guess... uh, Thinking about it, he was the original beast mode. I mean, no offense to Mr. Marshawn Lynch, but Hef was way bigger and faster than the rest of his competition compared to what Marshawn is now. Unfortunately, there was not any game film, so we can't go back and watch it. But I got to imagine, due to the violence of the game back then, that his true beast mode was a lot different than what it is now. Now, Hef didn't only play... Uh, football in high school. He played baseball as well. And apparently, or from at least from what I had read, is he played baseball and football for the University of Minnesota during his junior and senior year in high school. But at some point in time, Hef obviously graduated high school and he was going to go to a college. He had planned on going to the University of Minnesota, which he had a relationship with already because he was playing football for them for the past two years. So he knew the players on the team, he knew the coach, he knew everybody around. But from what I read, he was recruited by a Yale alumnus who saw him play a game in his senior year. I'm guessing it went down like this, you know, this uh, Yale alumnus comes to this game, a high school match, I don't really know what match it was against, but he sees this big hulking dude and he's like, what? 
I guess we probably should go after this guy because he's a man amongst boys and he's only in high school. I don't really know the timeline of events that happened, but the Yale alumnus apparently volunteered to tutor Heff to make sure that he could pass the exam to get into Yale. Now, as we found out in the previous episode, Yale was a powerhouse football team at the time. So being recruited by Yale meant that you had to be one of the top dogs in the nation. Especially because he was from Minnesota and you had somebody from Yale that was there to recruit this guy. I mean, recruiting goes on now, but it's a little easier because you have digital, you have cameras, everybody's got a camera, you can watch high school football games from YouTube. You know, it's not like back in the day, you probably heard of this legend. I wonder how big the stories were of this guy. Did this Yale guy go back to Mr. Walter Camp and say, hey, we got this guy for you. He's seven foot six, three forty two. He's able to run a four four forty. Now I don't really know if they captured forty yard dash times back then. I'm guessing that it would be possible, but that's something that we're gonna have to dig into a little bit later when we look at the first NFL scouting combine. So after Pudge got into Yale, he naturally had his first freshman practice. From the records that I could find, as a freshman, Pudge was six foot three, two hundred and ten pounds. But I'm telling you, this dude looked ripped. He was not what his nickname said, Pudge. He was, to me, more like Hef, like I said earlier, beast mode. Now, the average height for a male around that time was about 5'5", five 5'6", foot five, five foot give or take. If you were to compare that to me nowadays, would probably somewhere along the lines of being me standing next to like Kobe Bryant or LeBron James. Or even Calvin Johnson, for that matter. One of my favorite football players of all time. Thank you very much. Um, so, moving forward, we have Hef's um, playing years through college. He played from 1888 to 1891 for Mr. Walter Camp, which, from previous episode, we know is deemed as the father of American football. And during that entire four-season span that he played for Mr. Walter Camp at Yale, he only lost two games. Now, going back to that first practice that I was talking about, you know, Allen Iverson, practice? We're not talking about practice. One of Hef's future teammates by the name of William Herbert Corbin saw Pudge at his first freshman practice, and he apparently must have seen this beast mode of a dude as well, because he right on the spot said, you are coming with me, you're going to the varsity, I'm putting you on the line. Now, the only thing with it was, even though he was this beast mode of a dude, they didn't quite think that he met the nastiness standards of a Yale football player at that time. I have a quote that was supposedly documented by William Herbert Corbin himself, and it goes as such. The freshman Heffelfinger was six foot three inches in height, weighed 210 pounds, and looked like the most demure, gentle, self-effacing individual that could be imagined. His usual posture was head bowed, shoulders stopped, eyes to the ground with no idea whatever of his marvelous power and nature-given ability to strike terror in his opponents. Knapp did everything possible by word and deed to arouse Hef, so that he would give all he had in him for the good of the Yale team. Finally, at his wit's end, Howard decided he would try the sight of blood to stir up Hef's dormant bellicose spirit. He wrote Hef, with pen dipped in blood, which he had obtained from a slaughterhouse, one of the sharpest, strongest letters, using every reasonable form of expression to get Hef out of his lethargy. Hef, not knowing the nature of the gore, certainly must have been stirred. For the week after receiving the letter, he played the best game of the season against Princeton. Hef found himself that day, and from then on was a terror to his opponents. So keeping with the theme, I suppose, that letter was a creation of Beast Mode, which then ends up, as we will find out later, translating into the current Beast Mode, Marshawn Lynch, giving him the opportunity to have that contract to be able to play for the Oakland Raiders. Now, his first season was 1888, as I said, and in that season, his team went undefeated. Now, that is an awesome record in itself, but it doesn't even come close to show you how much of a devastating performance that team had on the field that year. The total point spread was 698 to zero for the season. 
That's right. What I said was they scored 698 points in 1888. And in 1888, the entire compilation of every team they played only scored zero points. Now you tell me any point in history, any game, any season, anywhere that you've ever seen such dominance. I couldn't figure it out. I'm not going to bother Googling it. I'm just going to go ahead and say that this is one of the most dominating seasonal performances of all time, period, the end. In Hef's second season, 1889, Walter Camp started the first ever All-American team. And on that inaugural All-American team was, of course, our hero, Hef. He was voted as the first All-American ever. And then again in 1890, and of course, 1891. He was voted in as an All-American every year that he was eligible. So over his entire collegiate career, he was on a team that went 55-2 and with two national championships, which were in 1888 and 1891, which happened to be his first and his last year with Yale. And then in 1951, he was rightfully so inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. Now, when he was in college, football wasn't his only thing. He lettered in baseball, rowing, and track. He also won the school boxing championship, and I guess he sparred with gentleman Jim Corbett, who was called the father of modern boxing for a scientific approach and innovation to his technique, which I thought was pretty cool when I looked it up because he worked with his coach, who was the father of American football, and He sparred with the father of modern boxing. So you have this guy that's in the middle of two of the biggest sports, and it's the innovators of the time. So it's kind of cool just to think about it. So all that college business out of the way, we know what we all came here today for. We want to know why was William Heffelfinger the first documented professional football player? Now, there were so many rumors all throughout, and it was kind of known that teams had paid players to play for them or they gave them special interests, they gave them some kind of expense coverage or you know other things. One of the things that I saw was they called them cakes. I don't know why they called cakes or they they called expenses cakes, but it was just a term that they used back then. I mean we have all sorts of terms down the road that we don't even know about what's going on right now. But the real reason why we're here is because we wanted to know What gives him the right to be called the first professional football player? Well, the seed was planted for Kirk Cousins and all the players around the NFL to have cash in their pockets on November 12, 1892. You and me are a modern fan, and we have just traveled back in time. And we are at what we think is a football game. But we're kind of looking around at each other going, this doesn't seem right. This does not look like a football game that I recognize. And that's because it wasn't. It just looked like a bunch of normal dudes running around. They had some torn up clothes, stuffing like sports rags in their shirts for shoulder pads or something like that. Some of them were wearing leather helmets, but the majority of them just weren't wearing any helmets at all. Kind of looked like backyard football. And of course, our hero, Hef, was much bigger than the rest of them. He stood out like a sore thumb. So I'm just kind of eyeballing this dude saying, what's going on here? There's something different. He doesn't quite fit in with the rest of these dudes. And as we find out much, much later, there was a significant difference about this guy. It could have happened before, but there is a documented reason why this guy is significant. But before we talk about that fateful game on November 12th, 1892, let's give you a little background. You see, the game that we're going to end up talking about is between Allegheny Athletic Association and the Pittsburgh Athletic Club. And they weren't really that old of teams, um, only born like a couple years earlier, but they had already become bitter rivals. And rumors had swirled, like I said, this team paid that guy, this team gave that guy some cakes, I mean expenses, I don't know why they call them cakes still. (laughs) I mean, maybe they were real cakes, maybe they gave him some kind of You know, I like cheesecake myself. But nothing was really documented. There was no physical, tangible proof that they had paid these guys. 
just accusations at the time. Now, the two teams had played for the first time on October 8th of 1892, and Allegheny won 20 to 6. So then, of course, they had a rematch, which resulted in a 6 to 6 tie, which, you know, a 6 to 6 tie seems kind of like a boring old game, doesn't really matter. No significance, right? Wrong. They had a player that was recruited. His nickname was Stayer, but it was later found out that he was the captain of Penn State, and his name was A.C. Reed. Now, when you have a player from Penn State playing on your team, there's a reason why, there's no wonder why the other teams would go, there's something I'm if. I'm not sure what it is, but I don't like it. So, of course, there was a rematch set once again. This time, it brings us a little bit closer to that game, and that is the game on November 12th, 1892. That is going to be between Allegheny Athletic Association and the Pittsburgh Athletic Club. But even though paying players was not documented, it was kind of like, hey, it's on. You brought this Penn State guy, the captain nonetheless, to play for you? And it was 6-6? to six? It was tied? Well, it's no holds barred now, dude. That's kind of what they were thinking. So, according to an article that I had found on History.com, The reason why Pittsburgh Athletic Club had agreed to this rematch for November 12th of 1892 is because they had a ringer. And here's a quote from that. And the quote goes as such. Its team manager had his eye on an even more promising ringer, Pudge Heffelfinger, who'd been a football star at Yale and was currently on leave from his job in an Omaha railroad office to play, in exchange for expenses, no doubt, for the fabled Chicago Athletic Association team. The PAC offered Heffelfinger and his teammate Knowlton Snake Ames $250 apiece to play for their team. Now, this offering was printed in the Pittsburgh Press. And legend has it that Heff scoffed at the mere $250 and was not willing to risk his amateur status. Which, in essence, we had our first holdout. We had our very first holdout before there ever even was a documented professional football player. Thank you very much, William Heffelfinger, for screwing my fantasy football team whole once again. You see, last year I decided to keep David Johnson instead of Le'Veon Bell in my keeper league, in my home league, which I figured, due to a holdout, Lev Bell could not hold up the entire year. And look what happened. Mr. David Johnson breaks his wrist to my beloved Detroit Lions in the first game. A bittersweet way to go out. Thank you very much, Mr. Pudge. But getting back on track now, of course, you put that in the newspapers and Allegheny's going to catch wind of it. So they snuck in. What they did was the back door on them. They offered $500. And now it's on, baby. In another quote that I found, Heff's great-grandson was interviewed, and he said the following. You don't think of $500 being a big deal, but I looked it up. The average annual income for a Pennsylvania family in 1892 was $834. Pudge made two-thirds of that in one afternoon playing football. In today's dollars, that's 12950 bucks. Now let's put that into modern-day perspective. Heff made $12,950, which he was the first documented professional football player. And that was just a heck of a lot of money at the time. Like they said, two-thirds of an annual income for an average Pennsylvania family in one afternoon of playing football. But if we compare that to what Kirk Cousins is making, on an average per game, and that's just regular season game, not all the practices that he has to go through, the off-season workouts and the preseason and postseason and all that other stuff, he is making $1.75 million per regular season game. So, Kirk, if I were you, I would reach out to William Heffelfinger's family and I would say, oh, thank you very much. I also kind of find it interesting that the just the general coincidences of Heffelfinger was from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and now we pull it full circle, and Kurt goes to Minnesota and has the highest contract ever. Good grief. As a Lions fan, this is not cool. But getting back to the game. The game on November 12th, 1892. Now there's different accounts that I found but they pretty much all fall in line with the same thing. 
Pittsburgh Athletic Club and the fans were in an uproar when they found out there was a ring around the field, which didn't really make sense to me when I was reading it because I'm pretty sure, as we just discussed, Pittsburgh Athletic Club had originally offered Heffelfinger to play for them. They were just probably sour because they were the ones that got outbid, just like in the current NFL. It happens all the time. Something that does make sense from like the, the fans' perspective was I'd be upset too if it's supposed to be an even playing field and it's just players from both sides from their hometowns or their own associations or whatever they play for and you got this dude that you went out and you paid illegally to play for you and I'm going to bet on this game? No, that is not cool, man. So apparently they were just like, this it, we forfeit, this game doesn't count because... They're bringing a ringer. And um, I only really found this from one source, but it was said that Allegheny played 11 players from Western University just to appease the fans. But until it was sorted out, I guess it wasn't, it kind of took a while, probably a lot of choice words going around. And it was into the afternoon where it was starting to get dark out. They decided, let's play this thing. We're going to do an exhibition game and we're going to play, which meant all bets were off because it was not a legit game. Um, Yeah. I know I'd be upset as a fan as well there, but it is what it is. Game's on. Let's play this thing. The game itself was probably more of a snoozer. Um, Really, all games were a snoozer back then. If you looked at it, it was snap the ball, run the ball, fall into a dude, fall down. Um, I mean, there was a lot of violence that went on in the game, so it was a little bit different. The game ended up with a score of four to nothing. And Heffelfinger scored the only points of the game which was a touchdown on a 35-yard fumble recovery. So with all that being said, of course, it was like everyone was happy, but no one was happy. The Allegheny fans were not happy because they wanted to collect their bets. And the Pittsburgh fans were not happy because they didn't like the idea that they were using Chicago players. However, this game was successful. Allegheny realized a net profit of 621 bucks. And that's even after they paid Hef, the first documented professional football player, $500 to play in the game. Now, I'm sure you guys are wondering why I keep saying the first documented professional football player. That's because this game had an expense sheet. And if you look at it at the link I'm going to provide to you, it's kind of cool because it's a close-up view. It says right at the top at the header, Expense Accounting Allegheny Athletic Association Football Club. And then there's down the line, it looks like it was a torn out page, maybe because they were trying to show the heading and then there was a bunch of other expenses. And it says, let's see here, game of November 12th, 1892, AAA versus PAC. And then it goes over here, it says, the balance carried over on the account was $468.35. And then it looks like the game receipts were $1,683.50. And then they have a bunch of other expenses. Um, Let's see here. Something about a visitor's guarantee expense for $428. Uh, Park rental expense for $50. I'm just thinking about nowadays. There's no way you could rent an entire... I mean, who knows where they played. If it was like a stadium or a... I don't know how big it was. But $50 to rent it is pretty cool. Now this part is a little bit interesting. I'm not sure why this portion doesn't get brought up more. But it says Donnelly, Malley... Heffelfinger expenses, 75 bucks. Maybe that's expenses to get them to the game, I'm not sure. But that part doesn't really get brought up in any of the articles that I've been reading about. Now we have the part that every article I have read references as the time where it is first documented that we have a professional football player. It says W. Heffelfinger for playing. And then it has cash. 500 bucks. There you have it. The first time you ever have it documented where we have a professional football player. Oh, so sweet. But then, so anyways, it says the total expenses are $1,062 with a net profit of 621 bucks. And this document, which is the expense sheet for the Allegheny game, has been dubbed ever since as Pro Football's birth certificate. And I think it's pretty cool that we have a document from 1892 with handwritten, looks like a journal, that we can trace back to say that 
professional football was born, and it's the certificate, nay, the birth certificate of the NFL. But from that day forth, it was pretty clear that the NFL was inevitable because Allegheny had a net profit of 621 bucks, which, at the time, was pretty substantial considering that the average Pennsylvanian family would get 890 bucks in an entire year. And I'm going to go ahead and link over to that birth certificate. I found a few different places where they have it on display, but there's an article in the Star Tribune. They have it where it's like a blown up view of it, and then as you scroll down, it highlights the Heffelfinger. I'm going to throw a bunch of other links in there for you too at the show notes, uh, which, by the way, you can get at www.thefootballhistorydude.com slash episode two. Now, even though Heff was known to be the first professional football player, at least that's what you and I know him as now, he at the time played an integral role in the advancement of football. And he was, from what I understand through the articles that I've been reading, known in the entire country as basically Mr. Football. In 1893, he coached for the University of California, Berkeley, with a record of 5-1-1. And then in 1894, he coached for the Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania with a record of 5-9. and nine. And then in 1895, he coached the University of Minnesota with a record of 7-3. and three. I don't really know why he bounced around so much for his coaching career, but um, to me that's not really as important as some of the other contributions that he made to the game. He was the founder, or he was the founding member of the Touchdown Club in New York, which gives out the Heisman Trophy to the best college football player every year. And he played football into his mid-60s, and he was known for his durability. There were a lot of different games that he played, but there were like a few that they really pointed out in most articles. Uh, one of them happened to be the All-Star Game. It was uh, kind of like a reunion of different kind of players from different times at the end of his career, his very last game. Another thing that I'd like to say is he was credited for being the first pulling guard. Um, most football was played at the line of scrimmage. It was, snap the ball, guy in front of me, smash! But he was so athletic, he was able to pull, get out on the edge, and then lead the running back to the promised land, which this ended up leading to the famous Green Bay sweep. He also perfected the art of stutter stepping around blockers to get to the ball carrier. Again, instead of just snap, smash, go, he would actually have some technique to it. I wonder how much the boxing career, albeit probably kind of short-lived, helped him out in that stutter stepping. He had to have that light feet. Another contribution he made to the game of football was he had a booklet that he put out yearly called Heffelfinger's Football Facts. Um, it had history of the game, some rules, kind of like the changes even happening, and just other things about football that would help advance the game to where it is today. Another thing that was interesting is it was known that Heff and former president Teddy Roosevelt were friends after Teddy saw him play a game for Yale against Harvard. Now, from what I saw, it looked like they were such good buddies that they had started a ranch venture in Montana. I don't know how much of this is true, but there was an article that I found in the Atlantic that said that Heff had actually helped convince President Teddy Roosevelt to not ban football. From uh, what I understand, he was receiving major public scrutiny for the amount of violence and deaths that had been happening in the game. So one thing that Hef had done, he proposed different kind of safety rules. Um, As I said earlier, you know, if you and I were to look at the game, it was nothing like it is today. They weren't wearing helmets for the most part. There was barely any padding. Um, you You can understand why there were so many deaths. We discussed in the first episode how Walter Camp was... um. Where he played a key role in protecting player safety and advancing the game to the point where it wasn't going to be shut down by the government. Again, I don't know how much of that is totally true. I'm just basing it off of some different articles that I saw. And even in these articles, they say rumor had it and we can't prove without a doubt. Um, there wasn't any kind of formal documents or anything like that. But it's kind of cool to me to think that the president of the United States at the time in the very early 1900s took the time out to try to help save a game that he saw there could be a future for. Um, There was a lot of other things going on at the time, of course. But nonetheless, even though he received scrutiny from the public for the different kind of deaths and the injuries, 
he was able to work with other influential key personnel to be able to make some changes for player safety and thus possibly save the game forever. I mean, I'm just thinking if it would have been banned at the time, then maybe, yes, there were going to be some backdoor, just like in Prohibition era where, you know, some illegal football games going on out in the streets. I mean, how are you going to stop somebody from just in their backyard playing the game, I guess, but from being a professional league sport that is recognized by the public? I don't know. It's We deal with that right now, too. I mean, the NFL is still trying to figure out how to protect the players to the best of its ability. And I think that they've come a long ways, but they even recognize that player safety is not to the level that it needs to be. And they're trying to make the equipment better, the training better, trying to make some different kind of rule changes. It's an ever-evolving topic to be able to keep player safety at top of mind, which ultimately should be the number one goal for the league. Another president that had some interest in Hef was former President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who once said that Heffelfinger was his idol. Now, this is talking about back when he was in college, of course, but I guess there was a quote to a sports writer on the president's first presidential campaign where he said this, While at West Point, my idol was Pudge Heffelfinger, and my ambition was to be partly as good as he was. My knee injury put a stop to that. Just like everybody else, man. Injuries get you the bug, but truth be told, you're just getting old. So as you can see, Heffelfinger had a huge impact on the football community. He really helped advance the game. You know, he made a lot of rule changes. He, of course, as we discussed the type, the title of this show, he was the first professional football player. He played for the great Walter Camp, the father of American football. He worked with Teddy Roosevelt, the former president, to make some rule changes that possibly saved the game. And he was even Dwight D. Eisenhower's idol growing up when he was at West Point. So what else could this guy do? A few highlights of Heff's career outside of the world of football were he produced the first sports quiz show on radio, and he also produced the first spy show, which he called Secret Agent K-7. He was active in politics. He was the delegate to the Republic National Convention in 1904 and 1908. He won his first elective office in 1924 on Hennepin County Board of Commission, and it looked like four years of it, he was the board chairman. Now, during Prohibition, he ran as a wet twice in the Republican primary for Minnesota's 5th Congressional District against Prohibitionist and former Lieutenant Governor William Nolan. Now, like I said, Heff undoubtedly had an interesting life. And if you want more information, he wrote a memoir that's called this was football. Um, I looked it up on Amazon, and it looked like there's really not that many copies. Um, a hard book copy that looked like it was really torn and tattered was going for like 45 50 bucks. I did not purchase this, but I am thinking about going ahead and looking at it at some point in time. It'd be kind of nice to have some history from the NFL and say having that book on my shelf that's saying, that guy right there, you know, when I'm older, going, hey, that guy right there, he's like 300 years old. Yeah, he published he published his book like really close near the end of his his life, and um, it's kind of bad. It, it's kind of sad, but he wasn't actually discovered as the true first documented professional football player until after he passed away on April second, nineteen fifty four, in Blessing, Texas. Now let's go back to the beginning of the episode. I promise you that I'm going to tell you about a book that can be linked to the NFL, not just some ordinary book. This book was at the Battle of Gettysburg, like physically there, in some dude's shirt pocket. And that dude was William Heffelfinger's father, who served in the Union Army at the Battle of Gettysburg. Civil War historians claim that he is the more famous of the Heffelfingers, because he was one of the first volunteers to sign up when the Minnesota Regiment was called to arms. Why is this book linked to the NFL, you ask? Well... Heff's dad was shot in the chest at the Battle of Gettysburg. And they say the only thing that actually stopped him from dying was he had this book in his shirt pocket. Now, I don't know what this book was, but that book is just as important as the NFL birth certificate, as far as I'm concerned. Because if he wasn't, if he didn't make it off of that battlefield, then our hero William Heffelfinger would have never been born, which means he would not have been 
the first professional football player, which means he would not have played for Walter Camp, which means he would not have helped possibly Teddy Roosevelt save football. Thus, we may not even have the NFL as we know it today, if at all. So yes, that book in that dude's shirt pocket at the Battle of Gettysburg possibly save the NFL. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about the true first documented professional football player. Now in the next episode, I'm going to tell you how a car dealership, buckets of beer on the floor, and cigar smoke saved professional football and led to what you and I now know as the National Football League. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.